Sideliners. I'm your host, Vicki Duvall. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Duncan Simpson. He's currently the Assistant Head of Mental Conditioning at IMG Academy in Florida. He has tremendous amounts of knowledge in his field and currently works with high-performance athletes across several sports. I'm really excited to discuss the importance of mental toughness as well as mental training. Dr. Duncan, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me on the uh, on the show, Vicky. I'm really looking forward to it, and it's great to see you again. Thank you. It's been a little while and a bit of a different setup. I've definitely had sessions before, but in your office, not on Zoom. <laughs> So you joined IMG Academy in 2017, and you've worked with athletes across all levels, student athletes and going up to Olympic athletes. Tell us a bit about your work and, you know, the sports that you work with at IMG. Yeah, so I I joined in in 2017. Originally, I was in academia down at a university in Miami called Barry University, Division II school. And they have actually very good athletics programs. So I worked with some of the, the, the student athletes there and worked with some clients um, privately. But since being at the academy, I, I came in, I worked in soccer, golf, and tennis. And uh, right now I, I primarily work just in, in, in tennis. I do sometimes some of the corporate work that we have corporate clients come in and occasionally some of the pro teams, but really 99% of my work is within tennis and I'm lucky enough to, to lead the department, so I oversee a, a team of 10, soon to be 11, mental coaches. So we work across all eight sports and servicing 1,100 student athletes. So I'm kind of working in terms of my own work, but then also helping and, and have the privilege to lead other mental coaches. Yeah, and I think, you know, I could speak for probably a lot of people at IMG when we say that, you know, we really benefit from your presence and having you there. I know I've learned a lot from my time at IMG. And before going into any sort of mental training, I feel like there's like a secret, you know, but I, people like want to know how to be mentally tough. And I guess sometimes it seems like there's like something that you're, you have to do. It's, it's like sort of a secret, but how would you define mental toughness? Yeah, I, I'll answer the question and kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent, Vicky. Uh, maybe <laughs> some of this will resonate with you. I think to, to simplify toughness or mental toughness, I think when I explain to your athletes, it's, it's the ability to do hard things. And I keep it that simple. So when we're up against challenges and difficulties, can we persevere and, and can we get through them from a, from a physical, technical strategy, but also a mental point of view. So my ability to do hard things or your ability to do hard things. But I think I don't really like to use the word mental toughness. I, I really, what I'm trying to work with in our student athletes, and I've certainly learned this through other practitioners in our field, I, I really resonate with the term mental flexibility. Because I think sometimes when we talk about toughness, it's a rigidity to it and it has to be this way and we have to be tough. Whereas the reality is when I'm faced with challenges, I have to be able to adapt and I have to be able to think differently and handle situations in a different way. So I want my athletes to be flexible. Of course, I want them to be resilient and I want them to be able to push through challenges, but I want them to be able to problem solve. And if I take it specifically to tennis, I think if we think about a a rigid mindset, be someone who goes in with one game plan and if this doesn't work, that's it. I, I have no backup plan. Whereas if I'm really mentally flexible, this is my A game, B game, C game. I can adapt here, weather conditions, all the different challenges that can come up over a course of a you know, three to five hour match, perhaps. Then I want to be flexible from a mental perspective. I love that mental flexibility. I think I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to note that down. I like that. <laughs> um, there's definitely some unique challenges that come with being a tennis player. And being flexible, like you said, could come from any sort of aspect on or off the court. Obviously, there's things like time zones and other factors that play into being a tennis player and also being an an individual sport. Is your mental training approach different for tennis players or do you use the same general principles across the sports you've worked with previously? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's obviously some some consistency in terms of there's some fundamental skills and or, or I'd call kind of psychological variables that we would want to see that are that are relevant across sports. Um, but then there's certain skills that are going to be amplified based on on the task itself. So, for example, 
skills such as such as communication is paramount in an interactive sport like basketball or soccer but it's not it's not a skill that's really relevant to to golf or, or tennis as apart from the communication with coaches so you know something like focus is pretty paramount for you know tennis golf but if you're you know um my lack of sport knowledge perhaps here, but if, if I'm a lineman at football, yes, I need to be focused. Is it the most important thing that I need? Maybe not. So I think it, depending upon the context of the actual sport itself is going to amplify the need for certain uh, psychological characteristics and, and skills. Whereas other contexts, it's kind of like a, you're going to dial up and dial down um, based on the needs. And, and I think also on the ability level and where they are in their development. So for example, if I take uh, a youth tennis player, 10 to 12 years old, and they're really learning the game, they may be fairly proficient as a 10 or 12 year old, but handling pressure, yes, it's important, but relative to a uh, you know, professional player like yourself, it's, it's, it's very different. So their perception, they may feel pressure, but is that the primary thing that I would want to focus on while working with them or is something in and around you know, it could be obviously confidence or making sure they have great practice habits and being accountable and, and being focused. Those are the kind of lower hanging fruit where you're going to have a, uh, like a bigger bang for your buck. Um, it's kind of excuse the terminology. So I'm, you're trying to kind of toggle on different areas to make sure you maximize the individual, but also understand the sport context. In the realm of professional tennis, what would you say then is one of the most important things to focus on for a professional tennis player? Yeah, and that's a great question. I think, you know, I I had the opportunity to work a lot in collegiate tennis and um, some athletes that were trend and some players were transitioning into the pros. But since I, I got to the academy four years ago, I've had the opportunity to work with some, some high level players on WTA and, and ATP. And I think what's What's really stood out for me is that it's not so much the individual mental skills. If you make top 50 in the world or top 100 in the world, you know, grand semi quarterfinalist, semi finalist, that, that you have a lot of the mental skills. Uh, you have the ability to be confident and focused and motivated. You have a routine. You have all these things. I think for me, it's um, helping that individual one to do those things more consistently. So being confident on a more consistent basis, being focused you know, um, having, having real clarity around the things that make them tick and being consistent. But I think having the, really the privilege to work with the pros that I have, it's been around them seeing their development and getting them to understand themselves and being comfortable in their own skin and being authentic. So sometimes the, you know, the, the, the top hundred in the world, but they may be 21 years of age and, you know, that's still very young. And you're still, you're still learning about yourself. You're still learning about those pressures and, you know, the travel and the agents and, you know, money and um, contracts and, you know, time zones, like you mentioned. So they're, they're kind of juggling all this with performance. So getting an athlete who's very comfortable in their own skin is not an easy thing. But again, it's kind of understanding that athlete and understanding their values, the things that are important to them and getting them to recognize their, that and, and making sure that they're really being authentic. Because when I see someone who's authentic of who they are and very comfortable, then the other things kind of fall into place. So I think with, with the pro athletes, it's less about, hey, I need to fine tune your routine. Maybe there's little things here and there, but it's really getting them to think about you know their values and what's most important to them and how do they get comfortable with who they are and where they are in their development. And then also, Hey, where do you want to go and how do you want to develop as a tennis player and as a person, you know, a husband, a wife, potentially, uh, you know, so those are kind of the bigger life stuff that sometimes you have to talk through. Yeah. And I think that definitely ties into a topic I want to get into a little bit later. I think being comfortable with yourself also kind of has to do with your self-talk, which is something I know we've talked extensively about and I want to get into it a little bit later. But for me personally, um, you know, going from where I am now to understanding kind of where I am now and versus where I was when I was top 100, I think there's there's a level of discipline that I've never really had in my life but I think it's something that's super important and I feel like with so many things in life also people sometimes aspire to do something but perhaps aren't always you know willing to do the work necessary to get there and I think personally on and off the court 
Um, I often find myself at a crossroads of motivation versus discipline when it comes to going for my goals. So what are some of the things that you suggest or you work on to help people build some discipline into their routines? Yeah, I think you highlight a really good point, Vicky, with regards to kind of discipline and motivation. And that's certainly the way that I like to frame it. I think that we're all human and we wake up on a daily basis with, with challenges and, and moods and sleep and all the things that can impact potentially our motivation, however well-intentioned we are. And, you know, like I said, I, I get to work with some phenomenal people and of course they're motivated, but everybody has those days and those weeks and those challenges come up. And I think you have a finite am amount of motivation sometimes. So I think if you're just looking, I'm going to do the right thing when I'm motivated, you're going to be limited. We're human. We're going to make, you know, we're fallible. We're going to make mistakes. So I think the very best is we'll, we'll do the things that matter even when they don't feel like it. And that's really discipline. Can I wake up and do the workout, you know, in the driving rain at five in the morning when it's dark and cold? Nobody, very few, not nobody, but very few people are like, oh, I can't wait to go do that. <laughs> but there's people who have the discipline to do it. Um, so I think it's, for me, it's, uh, one of the ways we, we, we look to develop that is when I'm working with an athlete is, is trying to have that self-awareness of recognizing the moments during the day. Invariably, we have kind of sliding doors moments where we, we get choices. And, you know, our tendency is obviously to pick the path of least resistance. Well, it's easy. Let's switch off the alarm clock and go back to bed. Whereas I know I need to do this or, you know, very simple, you know, very simple one would be food choices. Well, we, we 95% of people know the right food choices. I have a general idea about what's, what's healthier, but it doesn't mean we always do it. One, because, you know, sometimes the healthier options don't always taste as good, but <laughs> there's those challenges. So it's, I think it's for athletes is to recognize those opportunities, those choices. And then if it's a more difficult choice, it, it, you can analyze it, but it's probably the right choice. So picking those more challenging choices, um, picking those more difficult moments that's going to put up a little bit of resistance, that kind of scratchiness that we might have. Oh, I don't want to do this. But those are the things that we usually get more satisfaction from. Now, again, we're not perfect. We're going to sometimes pick the easier, easier route. Sometimes we need to do that. But it's, again, that self-awareness of am I just doing it because it's easier and it's not necessarily the right thing to do. So, yeah, I think, I think that's how I kind of frame discipline, looking, looking for those moments, picking the path that's going to move us closer to where we want to be as a person and as, a, as an athlete. And I think for, you know, for I'm going to stick to professional tennis here, but I think, like you said, it kind of goes beyond that as well. But I think obviously something that really helps is having a team around you that knows when to push you and knows what to say when you are having those moments where maybe you do want to snooze the alarm for a sec, you know? So I think it's always, you know, some players don't always have a team around them to do that, which is hard, but I think having that system is really helpful to stay on the right path physically and emotionally. So in what ways do you think coaches or perhaps the people around a player well, I guess specifically coaches can adjust their training in ways that implement sort of that mental focus as well during training sessions. Yeah, I think that if we, if we bring up what's called a kind of a, a resilience framework, and there's some great research out of the UK is in around the, the notion, and I'll simplify down, of kind of what's called a challenge support matrix. And it's basically we want to be in an environment that's supportive, but it's also challenging. So if it's overly supportive and it's under challenging, then it's not going to be very stimulating. It's just that kind of nice feel good factor. But after a while, people get bored of that. If it's, you know, super challenging and, and it's not a supportive environment, it's going to be that relentless environment where you're going to get burnout, where people are not going to enjoy it. So I think coaches and there's phenomenal coaches that do this is, is getting that balance between challenging an athlete making the session challenging and again that doesn't have to be physically exhausting it could be challenging from a strategic point of view or from a technical point of view or a mental point of view but they're not making sure that they have the relevant support it might not be support in that moment they may be a, a session where they really 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 challenge the athlete but the support comes right at the end 
And, uh, you know, maybe the support comes the next day where they kind of say, hey, you did great yesterday. We're going to have a different kind of session today. So making sure the athlete has that balance of, of challenge, but also support. And I think that's essential for coaches to, to think about that because we can always slip into one or the other being very challenging or very supportive when we've got to strike a balance. And again, you have to know your athlete. You have to know some athletes probably need a little more challenge and some need a little more support and they're going to challenge themselves. As you know, Vicky, there's going to be some players that they're going to push themselves to the apps. They're going to challenge themselves. And sometimes the coach's job is just to say, whoa, okay, take a breather now. You can take a week off. You can take a couple of practices off. Um, and, and again, working with some pros, they actually need, they need the coach to say, no, you need to be out here. You need to like, we're going to be out here, whether you like it or not. So again, it's, it is that coach athlete relationship. That's absolutely essential. I always find it interesting when I hear talk about, you know, how different personalities are for coaches. You know, I've worked with only a handful of coaches, but they always say like, how would you define your personality? And it's always such a hard question for me to answer because, you know, like you said, sometimes the coach has to push or sometimes the player has to push. I'm like, sometimes I don't even know. So <laughs> it's definitely a balancing act. And I read this on a forum, which I don't know how credible it is, <laughs> but I do want to pick your brain. <laughs> I don't know the source, so I can't say that, you know, it's actual scientific evidence that it, it's true. But there's a there was a quote that said um, tennis is ninety percent mental fortitude, which I guess in your case would be mental flexibility, which I love, and ten percent ability. Um, I definitely feel like obviously tennis is becoming more and more mental because everybody knows how to hit the ball. There doesn't seem to be a huge gap in ability or talent these days. Do you agree with that? Maybe not so accurate assessment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The. You know, um, and I don't want to talk myself out of a job here, so I'll be very careful. <laughs> what, I, what I'd say is, you know, obviously putting a percentage on it, I, I think it becomes a nice quote. Um, and I think all these things, the, the strategy, the technique, the physicality, um, obviously the mental side, they're all really important. And um, I don't want to downplay anybody's role or any, uh, any, anyone's contribution, like you mentioned, kind of a team. So I wouldn't say my, like a mental coach is any more important than a, a strength coach or an athletic trainer or, you know, the tennis coach themselves. What I would say is that if, if I'm realistic and honest about it, I think when we look at the real top athletes, and this is probably going to be a little controversial because I'm going to go a little against my field, is that genetics just plays a huge role. And that's a really unpopular answer. <laughs> People probably won't <laughs> like me hearing that. And you're probably shocked to hear it yourself. <laughs> but, but from a physicality standpoint, I'm not talking um, being a, a really good Division One tennis player or even a, a, a pro player. Um, I, th I think we can make up for um, what I'd say not elite level um, genetics by, you know, incredible mind and incredible strategy and technique. I, I think, but I think when you get to the real, real top, they have that plus they have the physicality in terms of just uh, whether it's um, the height, the, the makeup, the power, the speed, and that does come down to genetics. Now, having said that, having said that, the, the kind of the phrase that uh, a couple of examples that I like is, you, you know, I think the mindset piece is like having a Ferrari, but really the key to the Ferrari is, is really the mental piece. So you've got a beautiful machine and we probably all know athletes out there that just like they are the absolute specimen, but they don't necessarily have the key or they don't have the driver that's, that's really driving that Ferrari. So I think you need that Ferrari to get to the very top. You need to have that kind of makeup from a, uh, just a, a physicality standpoint, but then you need the key to be able to make everything work. And the other thing is like, and, and again, I, I think this is just a way of coach to think about it. Like my role in terms of what I do, like I think I can help a lot of people, but I, I, and I use this tongue in cheek and this is not to insult anybody, but I can't turn a donkey into a racehorse. So, you know, we can maybe through great coaching and great strength conditioning and fantastic mental coaches take uh, an average high school player and make them a really good college player. But you're probably never going to take them to top 50 in the world. Um, so I think 
there's it, it's a little bit of everything and i know that doesn't probably satisfy people uh, but what i've seen working with the top players there's a huge genetic component but also i think to reach the real real top you need to have the the mental skills now you don't necessarily have had to work with a mental coach i think there's you know top champions in the past that have never worked with a mental coach and have done it all themselves or they've worked with coaches that are phenomenal mental coaches so i think they've developed those mental skills through a practice and experience uh, so again, that kind of 90, 20, I'm not talking myself out of a job and say, hopefully, I, hopefully the mental part has a significant role to play, but I won't put a number on it. <laughs> <laughs> if your boss is listening, he better, <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> you, you're a pretty big advocate for visualization. And I know working with you personally, that's something I've benefited from in our sessions I never really understand why it's so effective. I just know that it works. Um, So what makes visualization such a powerful tool when it comes to working on the mental side of an athlete? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I'm probably biased because when I was in academia, a lot of my research was in around the field of imagery and, um, you know, managed to do research studies on some, you know, Olympic athletes and some, some high level performers that really kind of accentuated the, the, the power of, of imagery um, and visualization. And ironically, I, I don't do a ton with some of our junior players. One, because it's, it's difficult to execute in a group setting, which I'm, I'm often working in groups. And, and two, it, it's not necessarily a difficult skill, but it's one that sometimes makes individual younger athletes uncomfortable. However, I do think it's incredibly powerful because it gets people to think about, and and if I simplify it down, create a vision of what they want to achieve. And I think all too often we go into circumstances and we don't have that clear image. Now we we know from the research that visualization can, you know, improve mental areas like our confidence, our motivation, but it can also improve skill acquisition. So it can help us with developing a technique and, Um, changing our technique and retention and changing skills, Um, execution of really difficult tasks. Um, When athletes are injured and they don't have an opportunity to to actually play, again, a great opportunity to to visualize what you want to achieve, whether it's going over a certain strategy that your coach has set in place or um, working on a technical change or how am I going to handle this situation if I'm at this 5, 4, 30, all, you know, where would I go on my serve? Um, when I feel nervous, how am I going to handle that? All these things can be rehearsed. And we have a lot of downtime. So when you're on a plane and you're traveling to a tournament or you're waiting in between matches, there's a lot of opportunity to do some of these things. So I think it's a skill that's very, very transferable. And it's something that um, complete beginners can do. Although, like I said, I, I don't do it a lot with younger athletes because I'm usually with a group and it's difficult to execute in a group. But if I, if I ask younger athletes, hey, can you image something? they're usually phenomenal because younger athletes have that creativity. And as we get older, we kind of, that creativity is kind of pushed out of us a little bit, but if you ask young children to play, they've got an amazing creative mindset. So I think asking them, yeah, you know, what would you do here? And, you know, what do you think is a good situation here? So um, on a very kind of more neuroscience perspective, when we, when we get people to image, we switch from a, from really the emotional part of our brain in around the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, which is more the kind of analytical thinking and problem solving. And and therefore, if someone's struggling with the emotional side, getting them to visualize can really help with that. So again, there's lots of different areas where I think it can be beneficial for athletes. And, you know, on the big picture, just helping them think about where they want to go in their career. What do they want to achieve? Those are some things that, that can be very useful. I remember so specifically one of my first kind of encounters with visualization was when I was playing world team tennis, I was playing for the Philadelphia Freedoms, which is um, Billie Jean King's team. And I remember it was, I don't know what happened because we played indoors, so I don't think it was rain, but there was something wrong with the court and we couldn't practice and we were getting ready for our match the next day and Billie Jean King walks in and she's like, sorry, guys, we can't practice, but um, visualize yourself, like visualize your training session and it'll probably be better than you hitting anyway. And I was super young and I was like, what is she talking about? I was like, what do you mean? 
<laughs> I was like, nothing's better than us just going and hitting. What are you saying? Visualize hitting a ball. And I just thought that was like the strangest thing at the time. But then obviously the older I've gotten, I was like, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to visualize this practice. <laughs> so I think that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think what we know consistently, Vicky, is that um, physical practice, physical practice is, is optimum, but physical practice per, plus kind of visual practice on imagery is better than just physical practice. So you have to physically practice. You can't become a world-class tennis player by just thinking about it. Otherwise, we'd all probably do it, right? But, so, but it's a combination of. Um, so it's yes and. Uh, you, you know, the call wasn't available, so that was the best alternative at the time. Uh, so I, I think it's like, hey, how do we couple those things together? Yeah, and obviously it's Billie Jean King, so I should probably listen to everything she says. <laughs> probably got a good idea. Yeah, I think she knows a thing or two. Um, I want to get into, when I was doing my research about you, I saw that you did a graph of 10 tools to help somebody work on their mental training. And I thought it was really awesome. And it was like a really kind of interactive graph. And there's three points that I want to hit on the graph. One of the things that um, was mentioned on the graph is learn to redirect your efforts instead of quitting. I think there are many elements that can drive a player to start to feel burnt out. And it kind of ranges from, you know, either injuries or things off the court or kind of an accumulation of losses at tournaments. I think that's probably one of the biggest things as well. You feel like, okay, you know, there might not be a light at the end of the tunnel. So do you mind expanding on redirecting your efforts instead of quitting? Yeah, I think, I think the general premise and what we're told, and this may come back a little bit to that kind of toughness piece is that whatever challenges we're up against, we just, we just keep persevering. We put our head down and we grind and we grind and we grind and eventually things all, things all will, you know, work out. And I guess on, on, on the surface, that premise is not a bad one. You know, if every time we came up against a challenge and it was a little bit difficult, we just gave up, well, we'd probably never succeed anywhere. But I think really the art is understanding when, hey, I've been doing this for, I've been approaching this challenge this way for this long and I'm not seeing any changes. So I have to go in a new direction. And I think that's kind of the, the, really that, that problem solving and recognizing it's not quitting. It's I need to redirect my efforts into a, into a different, you know, into a different direction. So, you know, sometimes, and it, perhaps the players who are listening to this will understand it, you, you know, if you've been working with one coach for a long, long time and it's just really hit a plateau and you're doing everything you can, but your game's not taking it to the next level, it can be really difficult to take that, and, and take a relationship in another direction and to split from a coach and go in another coach. Or it, it could be, hey, I, I've been working out the same way and I really saw benefits early on and now again I, I've plateaued and I've plateaued for a long time. Or I'm going through injury recovery and I'm doing the same thing and nothing's getting better. And they, do we just keep pushing or do, do we change something? So I think it's that athlete's willingness to explore um, understand the reason why they're going to change the direction. Again, I don't want people just to, just to give up on something, but actually we sometimes need to redirect our efforts into another area. And I'd even say players who are transitioning out of the game, that's a really difficult, you know, decision to make and, and not one to be taken lightly, but at, at some point everyone's going to transition out. So is it quitting or is it actually I've got a lot to give in this area and, and this is going to fulfill me as a person, as a professional way differently. So I'm going to redirect my efforts. And I think we have to have a really intentional mindset around that and then also have a tough skin because sometimes we'll get feedback that we're quitting and it's not, and, and you have to understand it's not necessarily quitting. It's just, Hey, I'm, I'm going in a new direction and that's okay. And uh, we all have to have that, um, that kind of grace with ourselves to do those things at times. Yeah. And I think those are tough conversations, conversations to have with yourself and sometimes the people around you, but like you said, very important conversations to have. The second point I wanted to hit on was something we talked about earlier, which is definitely my biggest area of struggle, if you will. You said, stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. So I know for me personally, the little voice in my head is often more problematic than helpful. And I'd like to think that in recent times, that's been a little bit better. 
what kind of conversations should we be having with ourselves? Yeah, that's a great question. I know that's something that I've said a lot in, in the past. And I think we sometimes become um, a slave and we become, we become a victim of that internal dialogue. And there's very few people that are at a stage where they, they really have um, a huge amount of control over that inner dialogue. There's some people, and, and obviously through different practices such as uh, meditation and mindfulness, you, you can become um, pretty good at managing it. We're never going to get to a, percent, a, a place where you're 100% controlling all the voice in our head. So you have to recognize where, where, where some of that internal dialogue is coming from, and it's coming from insecurity a lot of times. It's coming from our ego. It's coming from mood. It's coming through you know, our physiology and our biology and, and our history and our genetics. And a lot of times it's like, whoa, well, how did I think about that? Why am I thinking like that? I don't want to think like that. And for most people, if you ask them, you say, hey, do you want to think like that? They say, no, of course I don't. So if you don't want to think like that, you, are, you understand that that's not 100% under your control. So what is under our control? That's where I want to focus. And it's, well, what, what, what is the message that I want to be telling myself? And what is the the thing that I want to be saying. Uh, and again, I kind of think about that self-talk in three ways. It's, you know, what do I say to myself in my head um, and the bit that I'm in control of, that conscious control? What do I say out loud? And then what do I say to other people about myself? And I think there's those three things because the thing I say in myself, that's important. The thing I say out loud, whether it's anyone's listening or not, that's also important. But it's also what I tell other people about myself. So I, I tell my players all the time when someone says, you know, how's your tennis? And you just say, oh, I suck. I'm terrible. Da, da, da. Well, guess what? This is the, the picture you're painting of yourself. And you have to be very careful about that. Um, so with that, it's really about, hey, what are the things? What are the, what are the comments? What are the phrases? What are the things that are going to serve me and take me in a direction I want to be as a person and professional? So if what comes out of my mouth is hurting me and is taking me a direction that I don't want to go, then I need to be aware of that and I need to change it. So if it's like, you know, I'm just not strong enough. I'll never get that. Da, 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 which we can all get into that space. Well, is that serving me? Is that going to help me? No, we know how strong negativity is. So it's not, it, for me, it's not just about being positive, but it's what are the things I'm telling myself that is going to take me in the direction so it's like, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling right now, but I can do hard things and I'll get over this. And I know I'm headed in the right direction. And, I, and I've got a support system. Like, that's completely different. So again, we control that. Um, we don't control the thing that just pops in our head a lot of times. Um, if you can, then good on you. <laughs> but we all have those challenges. And as a mental coach, I have those challenges on a daily basis. And again, I think practices like meditation and mindfulness will help quiet, quiet that voice and not let it control us, but it, we're, we're never going to be under full control. I think, you know, that's something I've definitely understood a little bit more in recent times, sort of like the power of your words, because I always felt like, you know, especially when it comes to certain circumstances in my life, and I think other people can relate to this. Sometimes when you say something self-deprecating, you say it out of humor or thinking that it, you know, you're just saying it to be funny or I don't know. For me personally, that's how I felt. Um, with different things at times. And like you said, like it's so, you're projecting something that's not positive. And even if you're trying to say it in a joking manner, it's still something that subconsciously you're imprinting in your thoughts. And I think for me personally, that's been sort of the biggest thing I want to work on is like, even if I want to say something out of like thinking I'm being funny, like it's not because you are projecting a reality onto yourself. And it's it's kind of like a really complex thing for me in my mind. I don't know why it seems sort of pretty simple, but that's something that I've always found really interesting. And, and it's only recently that I really like understand the power of that. My mom tells me all the time, like, don't say that. And I'm like, you're being dramatic. I'm joking, <laughs> but it's true. You know, you're saying these things and. I yeah. Mean, well, if, if you take, you know, I, I want to be kind of respectful of the time right now and the situation we're in. And I don't think it's an overstatement by, words and actions but words literally can change the course of history and, and what people say and how people and and the words that people use 
can inspire, they can cut down, they can alienate, they can divide, but you can connect, you can bring happiness, you can unite, you can literally change the world by the way words are used. So when someone says, well, it's not important, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's incredibly important. And we have to be, the words that we'd use if we were, if we were the, the president or if we were at a really public platform, the words that we choose there, we have to be really intentional with the words that we use to ourselves and what is the message that we're sending out into the world and how we're choosing to speak to people, but how we're choosing to speak to ourselves. Because I think we're all better served if, we, if we're really intentional with how we want to choose to, what we choose to say to ourselves. And a lot of times our players will say things to themselves that they would never say to a doubles partner, or they would never say to their mom, their dad, a friend. So I think words, and I hope it's not hyperbole, but words literally can change the course of history. And I think on a, on a micro level, like words can really define and really change your psyche and how you use them. So I really want people to be intentional. Again, I'm not preaching that you, you have to be perfect. We all get down on ourselves. We all say things that, you know, we're all tough on ourselves in moments but I think it's like, well, is this serving me? Is this taking me towards where I want to be or away from where I want to be? And if it's taking you away, you choose what comes out of your mouth. Um, so that's why I always remind people, you choose what you say. It's really important. Yeah, and I think obviously with 2020 being the dumpster fire that it has been on so many different fronts, that's something even more important this year for friendships and relationships and kind of tying it back to tennis here, the last thing I wanted to ask you, 2020 has been a really difficult year for many reasons for players. We've been forced to miss out on competition. I mean, I don't think I played one tournament this year, so which is not new for me, <laughs> which is so sad to say. But um, there's still a huge level of uncertainty with tournaments and how the calendar is going to be laid out. And I think you know, players like myself, we certainly hope that there's going to be more opportunities in 2021. But so far, you know, four tournaments have been canceled in January and Australia is still kind of up in the air. I mean, things are very up in the air right now. What advice do you have for players going into 2021? Oh, boy. Um, I guess why you, you asked me on to give advice. I'm always cautious about giving advice to, <laughs> to professionals that this is their job. So I, I don't know if I'm in a position to give advice, but I, th I think some reflection would be, I think the people, uh, and the players, and at least from a perception standpoint and the players I have the opportunity and privilege to work with, I think it's that they see the opportunities where other people won't. And, and, and I think sometimes at the center of it is a, a, for me, it's a sense of optimism. And how can I make the best of this situation? There's no doubt this has been a challenging year from a, obviously from the pandemic, from a social injustice point of view, from a financial point of view for a lot of people out there really struggling. It, it's, and this is worldwide, not just in the United States. It's certainly amplified in moments in the, the US, but it's how do I, how do I believe that the best is coming? And then how do I look at what are the areas that I can take an opportunity in? So in this time, I think there's some players and I've seen some on social media, they've been doubling down on reading books and learning. And um, some have taken university courses that they'll have never had an opportunity to do and reconnect with family and friends and have really been intentional. Like, oh, wow, I have never had this chance. I never get a chance to sit down and read a book and, and to do X, Y, and Z or to potentially, hopefully, work on your mental game. Like, wow, what an opportunity. For some of them, I know some players will come back to the tour, you know, fitter, stronger, faster. Yes, they may not have that tennis specific. I know some get to practice, but even when we're in lockdown, some couldn't practice, while some could. And those that could practice, they were at a huge advantage. So I think it's like, where do I find those little opportunities and recognizing that, you know, times will change. This is a moment in time and it's really difficult. And I have a lot of empathy for players, especially those that, you know, they're not earning money. This is their livelihood. That's, it's really difficult for them. I, you know, it, they don't have the opportunity to go and earn money. And that's, you know, very challenging. So I certainly have enough, a lot of empathy for that. At the same time, it's like, where can I, when things return to, and I don't want to say normal, when things when we're able to resume some of those activities, it's like, what position am I going to be in? 
am I going to be a better well-rounded person? Am I going to be fitter, stronger? Am I going to have a better mental game? Have I expanded my horizons, learned about something else, thought about a career post-tennis? All those kind of things that um, I've seen pl- I've seen players doing that, and I think that's a positive. And, uh, you know, it's kind of taking taking the positive out of a really challenging situation. And again, I want to, I do want to, you know, emphasize that it, I really understand how difficult it is for players. And those that just want to take some time off and, you know, kind of decompress and recover, I completely understand that. So I'm not preaching. It's just like, hey, where, where do we find those little gaps and how can I make the best of this situation? Um, while knowing it's really difficult out there for a lot of people. Yeah, and I think some of my friends that I've talked to were obviously all in similar situations. Some players have been able to play and some haven't, but we've kind of always talked about the perspective of how we can look at this year. You know, I've had some friends who are like, you know, on the spectrum of, yeah, it's been awful, but what can we take out of it that's a bit positive that'll take us into the following year? So for me, you know, obviously I had some injuries and and oftentimes I felt like I came back to the tour a little bit too soon and not strong enough, not, you know, maybe I was mentally ready to compete, but I wasn't physically ready to compete. So I think I'm really taking the time to be in the gym as much as I can. I mean, I'm so sore right now as we're speaking. I'm like straightening my legs every so often when I can. I'm like, I'm going to cramp any second. I feel it. (laughs) Um, But I think that perspective is huge. And I think you know, I mean, shoot, have we ever had a year like this in history? Like, it's just yeah. seems like it's it's just never ending. So I think that perspective is huge. And I think to add on to that, and something I've told my team is like, I I don't want to go. A lot of people are saying like, I can't wait to get back to normal. Well, you know what? Normal, normal wasn't great for a lot of people. You know, uh, I think we've seen that in this country. Like normal wasn't great. Like, let's let's go back and let's, let's let it be better. Whether it's, I, I go back and I have better relationships. I'm a little kinder to my neighbor. I, I, you know, invested a little more time in myself. I, you know, a little more time in relationships with my family and friends. I, you know, care a little bit more. I give a little more to charity. I, I, I do things a little differently because this year has been so challenging. And I think it's illuminated a lot of, um, injustice in a lot of different ways and, and a lot of and how different areas struggle and people struggle and I don't want to go back to normal I, I want to be able to you know go out without my mask on I want to be able to do that of course I think everyone's looking forward to that but I, I want to go back I want to go forward and, and not back and I want to hey when we all come out of this are we going to be better for it because I don't think it was as good as we all thought it was and I think some of this is just the pandemic not to get too much on a soapbox, but it's kind of, it's opened a lot. It's opened up a lot of people's eyes to a lot of different challenges and not just from a health perspective. And I think if we can move forward and and say, okay, I learned a lot of lessons here and I'm going to be better as an individual. I'm going to be better as a colleague. I'm going to be better as just a, you know, part of this society. Then that's, that's where I think we learn a lot. So I I don't want us to go back to normal. I, I want us to create a new, a new direction, whether it's not just the US, but I think across the world, I think there's opportunities out of really challenging times for a lot of people. You heard it here, sideliners. Let's do better and let's be better. (laughs) Dr. Duncan, you are a wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it so much. Thanks ever so much, Vicky. Thanks for the podcast. I love this opportunity. Of course. Thank you, sideliners, for tuning in to the episode this week. I look forward to catching you next week. Have a great rest of the week. Bye. Bye.